All right. I was saying to a family before the church, we still, before service, we still have, I said, as I look at the calendar, there's still a lot of interruptions on the horizon, uh, being out of town, missionaries, the Lord's Supper coming again. And so I've decided to hold off on returning to our systematic theology series. I am going to get back to it. We are going to finish it. But uh, before we get back to it, I'm, st- I'm going to preach a few, a few messages on other subjects. And tonight, and for another couple, I'm going to do a, s- a few messages on the doctrine of spirituality. The doctrine of spirituality. And uh, I've been reminded of this a lot lately for some good reasons and some bad. Uh, on the bad side, I've been reminded just how, how much, how weak and how carnal much of our Christianity is. I, I, was, I was with someone uh, recently, and I, a, a Christian, and they, they had a bracelet on. And it said, well, I can't say what it said. It had an expletive toward cancer. Perhaps you've seen it. Should Christians wear that? See Christians carrying pack of beer out of the store. Is that a good testimony? I don't hear lots of responses, so I'll just make the responses myself. No is the answer. Those are not good testimonies. I don't like cancer. (laughs) But Christians don't need to talk that way. Um, I've just been reminded as I've been looking around and listening, there's a strong need We're getting very close to the return of Christ. Don't you think we should be ready when he comes? Don't you think that we should be living properly? I've been, I've been, just the need has come back in my mind about, we got to get back to sanctification. We have to get back to, well, we need revival Where's the fire for God, the love for Christ? We just need to get back to basic repentance. Where when God deals with us about something that we don't try to get our way out of it. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be under conviction and know what you ought to do, but think of every way under the sun where you could justify yourself in not doing it. There's just no way around it, friends. We're going to have to come back to just basic repentance. So I'm hopeful that tonight's message and a couple others will point us in that direction. Because I want to talk about spirituality. And, and I think it's fair to say that the world in general knows very little about spirituality. Would you agree with that? In my study for this sermon, I did some reading from a book called Spirituality for Dummies. Everybody know that series, right? Computer coding for dummies and whatever else it is. They have all these series of books. They have spirituality for dummies. It's by a, a lady whose name is Sharon Janice. I don't know her, but uh, she wrote a book on spirituality. And I don't want to read to, your, to you her full explanation of it, but I'm going to give you three or four sentences from it that kind of give you the gist of her argument. According to her, spirituality is the process of connecting with or tapping into what she calls, quote, the profoundly powerful and divine force that is present in the universe. Now, what does that sound like? What does that sound like? Somebody's saying it. I I heard it somewhere. Excuse me? It sounds like New Age. But when you're talking about the force, it sounds like something out of Star Wars. 
right? I mean, it's like it's something that you can connect to or tap into, like your Luke Skywalker, you know, the feel the force. Like, you know, it's like that's what she's talking about. And if that weren't bad enough, then she goes on to say that this great force in the universe, which she calls, now listen to it, she calls it the divine light. She says this divine light actually ex exists inside every one of us. And that's exactly like Star Wars. The force is flowing through all living creatures. That's what she's saying. And therefore, because this force, listen, because this force is inside of you, one of the main teachings of spirituality is to look within and find what you seek within yourself. Joel Osteen agrees. He says it this way. You must discover the champion inside. Now, these first two tenets of her philosophy have a, have a necessary religious corollary. First of all, since every person has this spiritual light within, right, then every belief is equally valid. And since every person has that same force within, then whatever they believe is equally valid. And no belief is binding on any particular individual. That is her language, not mine. In Miss Janice's own words, here's what she says. A, quote, spiritual person loves and respects all religions, but they don't have to believe or agree with any one particular religious doctrine. As she puts it, quote, that's what's so fun about the world. Everybody's doing something different, and each one believes deep in his soul that what he believes is right. So let's boil down what she's saying. The essence of her philosophy is, since we all have this force, each one of us is a little god. And because whatever we believe is right for us, then every imagination of our heart is in fact true for us. Now friends, that's not only, that's not simply, that's not merely logically incoherent. That is satanic. That is just straight up satanic. That comes straight from the pages of Genesis chapter 3. The devil said, Satan said, ye shall be as gods, knowing, deciding for yourself what is good or evil. Now look, many of us as Christians, hopefully we can recognize her I don't know what this is, just incoherent babble. We understand this is counterfeit. This is satanic counterfeit Christianity, right? We know that. But very few Christians have a handle on, well, if that's wrong, but what is right? What is true? What is biblical spirituality? And I just want to remind you again, spirituality is not a, keeping a list of things that you stay away from. It's not avoiding a list of vices like, you know, well, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls that do. And I, that does not make you spiritual. Okay? Christianity is not wearing particular clothes or carrying a particular Bible. I mean, that's just, that, those things don't make you spiritual. Okay? In a technical sense, spirituality, from the Bible's definition, is the condition of being what Ephesians calls filled with the Spirit. But what does that mean? Is, I mean, is the spirit a gas like that fills the universe? I've got me some spirit right there. Is that, is that it? No. You can't put the spirit in a jar. That's, that's not what spirituality is. It's not what it's, it's not what it's talking about. Okay? Being filled with the spirit, that's a metaphor that Paul uses. It's a metaphorical way of describing someone who is rightly related to, or I would say in a proper relationship with the Spirit of God. Okay, that's what it is. I think you would agree with me that there's a big difference between, between Christians. If we look at out across all Christians, there's a big difference in, between Christians in terms of their character, in terms of the quality of their daily life. There are some Christians, for example, that are happy, and some that are not happy. Some are angry. 
There are some who are under control, some who are crazy and out of control. There are some who display wisdom and others not so much. Right? Well, in the New Testament, how do we account for that difference? They're all saved, so how do we account for that difference? We account for that difference by explaining it in terms of a person's relationship to the Holy Spirit. Someone who's filled with the Spirit gives evidence of Christ-like character. Right? They manifest the fruit of the Spirit. They engage in distinctly Christian service and so on, whereas a Christian that is not filled with the Spirit lacks those traits. Now, here's some good news for all of us who are unhappy and undisciplined and and unwise, uh, the scripture makes it clear that it is possible, in fact, it is desirable that every Christian improve in these areas. It's possible. It's possible for unspiritual or carnal Christians to move from the place of immaturity to the place of maturity. And it's possible to do so very, very quickly. Very quickly. In fact, Sudden and radical improvement is guaranteed to every Christian who simply meets three conditions so as to become filled with the Spirit. And it's these three conditions and how to meet them that I want to consider in our time. So open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians in chapter 4. Verse 25. We'll stand together when you find it. Ephesians 4 and verse 25. Very simple. Ephesians 4 and verse 25, the Bible says, Wherefore, <clears throat> putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Right? You put off and you put on, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. By the way, I just, I'm not going to preach this message tonight, but that does not mean that you should not go to bed angry. Okay? That, that is good advice, but that's not what this passage teaches at all, okay? It's just, it's, it's saying to be angry. There are some things that you should be upset about. God is angry with the wicked, for example, every day. There are some things that you ought to be angry about. There are other things that you should never be angry about. Is this making sense? If it's worth being mad about, it's worth staying mad about. Hello? If, it's, if you're angry at immorality and unrighteousness, you shouldn't get over it. Anyway, that's not the point of this passage. We'll come back to that later. Be ye angry and sin not, neither let the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. What a great verse that is. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Wow, what a great passage of scripture. I want to preach to you a message tonight entitled, Grieve Not the Spirit. Grieve Not the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. So thankful for your word. Help us to understand it tonight. I pray, God, that you will uh, bless as I try to explain, and I pray that you'll help us as we listen to apply and obey. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. All right, I think it should be apparent from this section that sin, right, this one verse, verse uh, uh, 30, I think it should be clear from this verse that sin destroys spirituality. It grieves the spirit. And the reason for this is because if sin is tolerated in our life, if we know that we've done something wrong, We've been selfish, we've lied, we've stolen, whatever it is that we've done. We've, if we tolerate that sin in our life, then the spirit who already indwells us, he has to change his ministry from working through us to help others to now suddenly working on us. 
We don't become the, the, the vehicle of his ministry. We become the object of his ministry. All right? He's no longer conducting his work through us, but now to us. The Bible does not teach, again, that the Spirit withdraws from us. All right? You're not going to lose the Holy Spirit. Once he's come, he's there to stay. The Bible does not teach the Spirit withdraws from us because of sin. Instead, it says in verse 30 that he is grieved by our sin. So, every single day that you are living as a Christian, every single day you're in one of two conditions. You are either, you are either grieving or not grieving the Spirit. You either have a grieved or an ungrieved Spirit within you every single day. So the question is, if we have sinned and grieved the Spirit so that His filling ministry cannot operate, what are we supposed to do? How do we fix that? Before we answer that question, let me make one thing clear. When we're talking about sin in our lives as Christians, we're not talking about all the stuff in your life that you don't know about. Okay, probably all of us, in fact, not probably, all of us have things in our life that are offensive to God, okay, but that we don't know about. But God does not reveal all of those things to us all at once. Can you imagine if God showed you every single thing that was wrong in your life simultaneously? You'd be overwhelmed. Couldn't even keep track of it all. All right? His sanctification process is slow and progressive. He raises issues in our life in an order in which we can address them. Okay? When I was, well, I used to coach little kids basketball and many other sports, baseball and other things. When I was coaching little kids basketball, it's funny when you have these little kids because they make so many mistakes. They make more mistakes than you can imagine. They can't. They can't shoot, they, can't, they can barely run, they can't dribble, they can't pass. I mean, it's unbelievable. They can barely walk and chew gum at the same time, about half of them. But I never tried to go in there and say, all right, kids, tonight we're going to learn how to pass, shoot, dribble, and all everything. No way. There's no way. You can't correct all of their mistakes in one night. There's, they can't handle it. Instead, we cover the most pressing issue. Okay, we're going to learn how to dribble tonight. Uh, or we're going to learn one thing at a time. And after we correct those things, then they're ready to move on to something else. And then they're ready to move on to something else. And as long as they're making progress, we're satisfied, even though we know that they're not where they ultimately need to be. Okay? And God does the same thing. He doesn't bring up every possible fault in our lives. And thank God, what he does do is the next thing. All right? So, when we're dealing with sin, we only need to worry about the things that we know are wrong. And believe me, that's plenty. That's plenty. So, anyway, if we've grieved the Spirit, what do we do? Well, what does the Bible say to do? There's one condition that is set forth for getting things right in your life. And it's crystallized into a single word. That word is confess. Confess. Now, that's a huge word. And I want to make sure that we don't understand it. So, or that we do understand it. That we don't misunderstand it. You knew what I meant. Be quiet. Turn with me over to 1 John chapter 1. Let's look at this. 1 John chapter 1. I could hear all the snickering. 1 John. And look in verse 1. 1 John chapter 1. And I said verse 1. Verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him. Verse 5. 1 John 1 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, if we say that we have no sin, again, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right, and this is a very, very, very famous passage. And John, who is an absolute expert on the conditions necessary for both fellowship with the Father and with the Son, he writes here to remind us that God is light. Again, metaphorical language. When he says God is light, he means that God is perfect holiness. No sin in him whatsoever. And therefore, if we say that we have fellowship with God and yet we are walking in darkness, we have sin in our life, then we are lying, obviously, and not doing the truth. But on the other hand, if we are walking in the light 
as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's clear here that sinless perfection is not what he's talking about. He's not commanding us, for example, to become the light. We're not God. We cannot do that. He's not commanding us to become the light. Only God is the light. Instead, he's telling us that we need to be properly related or properly adjusted to the light. How do we do that? Verse 9 tells us, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right? So when we have sinned and have become defiled, then that defilement is forgiven or removed and cleansed once we make confession of that sin okay now i don't want you to misunderstand or hear something i did not say because we are not forgiven simply because we ask asking and confessing are not the same thing let's be clear about that asking and or confessing and simply praying for example those are not the same things We are not told that we'll be forgiven upon the condition of prayer. We're told that we're going to be forgiven on the condition of confession. All right? A whole bunch of people are praying for forgiveness that have no interest in confessing. And God will not answer that prayer. Someone says, okay, well, what what, what does it mean to confess? It's a good question. The Greek word that is translated to confess in verse 9 is hamalog. Gomain, Hamalagomain. And according to the lexicon, this word means to share a common view. To share a common view. It means to be of a common opinion or a common mind about a particular issue. All right? And so it means to agree. That's literally what the word means. So to confess means that when you have sinned, You come to share the same opinion about that sin. You come to agree with God about that sin. You come to share his mind on that subject. Now, here's the question. According to the Bible, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, what is God's opinion about our sin? How does it make him feel? What's his mind on that matter? What did verse 30 say? It grieves him. It says the attitude of the Holy Spirit toward our sin is that it grieves him. All right, so confession then needs to be understood in terms of grieving or sorrowing over our sin. Not sorrowing over the consequences of our sin. That's not the same thing. Sorrowing over our sin. And you probably can guess what that looks like. When I was a a boy, uh, my dad used to make me sit right where Lily is, right in the second row. And he would be in the choir or wherever he was on the platform doing something. And I had certain responsibilities for my dad. You have to sit still. You have to sing. You have to pay attention. You have to be looking up here. You can't be fiddling around with your neighbor or talking or something else. And if I wasn't, let's say he was sitting up here on the platform and I was doing something I should not be doing, I would catch him looking at me. Everything else would be going on, but he'd be looking at me. And all of a sudden, we would make eye contact. And Dad would say, Now, friends, do you know what that meant? I'll tell you what it did not mean. It did not mean knock it off. It included that, but that's not what it meant. What it really meant is that when we get home, you're going to die. So we're at church. The service is just getting started. This happens. Now I have to sit through the entire sermon. The whole way home. And that entire time, I was grieving. Everybody understand? Grieving. I was kicking myself for what I had done. I was in deep distress, emotional agony, 
making vows. I will never do that again, right? Okay. Is that under, everybody understand? That's what we're talking about here. Just to make sure that we understand, let's look at a couple passages of scripture. Go with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Take a look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, look down in verse 8. Paul is going to give an, an example of true sorrow for sin on the part of a Christian. Now, I think everybody knows in, the first, in his first letter to the Corinthians, uh, Paul had written them, the Spirit had used Paul to write a letter to convince the Corinthians of their sin. They were wrong in many areas, many areas. And he has a stern rebuke. As we've been going through 1 Corinthians 1 through 4, we've learned. I mean, Paul has laid the hammer down. He's been on them. And in his second letter, we're given an account of how they responded. We're told about their sorrow for that sin and the effect that sorrow had upon their lives. So this passage here in 2 Corinthians 7 shows us what genuine confession looks like in a Christian's life. Look at verse 8. Paul says, though I made you sorry with the letter, I don't repent over it. I'm not, I'm not sorry about it. I was for a while. I did repent, but I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were for a season. But he says, now I rejoice, not simply that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. Now just stop right there. These people were grieved over what Paul had written to them to the point that they thought, we got to change. This is wrong. What we've been doing is wrong, and they wanted to change. And then he goes on, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. You didn't want to get in trouble. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation... Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. Here is now he's going to explain what it looks like. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. They had a desire to get things cleared up, straightened out. Yea, what indignation. They were ticked off over what they had done. What fear. What vehement desire, yea, what zeal, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Right? So, even if you don't understand everything that Paul has just said there, you get the gist of it, don't you? When the Spirit used Paul's writings to make them aware of their sin, they didn't just say, oh, well, Lord, you know, please forgive me. No. They came to see their sin the same way that Paul saw it, the same way the Spirit saw it. They agreed with him, and because they agreed with him, then they experienced grief and painful sorrow over their sin to the point that they were ready, in fact, eager to change their behavior. That's what confession means. Many people are asking God to forgive me, but they have no intention of giving up what, what has grieved him. They're still looking for a way to justify it, still looking for a way to excuse it, and that does not work. Let me show you another aspect of this. Turn back with me to 1 Corinthians 11. Go as quickly as I can here. 1 Corinthians 11, look in verse 31. We, we should be very familiar with this, having dealt with the Lord's Supper so many times. 1 Corinthians 11, look in verse 31. Paul says again, if we would judge ourselves... We would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Did you catch the order here that Paul anticipates? He points out that as our Father, God is waiting for us to exercise self-judgment. God does not want to have to get involved just like you don't want to have to take your kids and discipline them. You're hoping that they're going to see what they've done and say, oh, that was a mistake, and not do that again. Wouldn't that be awesome as parents if we never had to deal with our children? But of course, we don't always do that. But God is waiting for us to exercise self-judgment. He wants us to see that we're in the wrong and confess. To value the fellowship and our relationship with him so much that we try to get right. But if we won't, well then, he has to get involved. And that process of being involved, he calls chastening. 
And it's, again, it's because God is a gracious father that he gives us the opportunity to judge ourselves. But if we refuse to confess and to show godly sorrow over our sin, because he loves us, he can't just overlook it. So he has to administer chastisement. Again, parents, that's what godly parents do. You cannot simply overlook sin. You've got to get involved and bring about that repentance. And that's what God does. Now, let's look how, at how God does that. When we want to talk about chastisement, the central passage on that is in Hebrews 12. Let's go over there. Hebrews chapter 12, very quickly. Look at verse 3, or look at verse 6, rather. Hebrews 12 and verse number 6. Look at what it says here. For whom the Lord loveth, again, it's because he's, it's, it's motivated by his love for us. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And the Bible says, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, the very next verse tells us that when he chastens us, again, God is dealing with us as with sons. It's because we're in a relationship with him. It's because he loves us that he does this. Then verse 10 tells us the reason that God engages in this chastisement is so that we might be partakers of his holiness. Again, I go back to what I said at the beginning. We need to get back to sanctification. We need to get back to holiness because that's what God is trying to produce in our lives. He is dealing with us. He brings us to church and we hear all these messages so that we will grow to be more and more like him. Chastisement is much more than simply correction and punishment. That's not really what it's about. The meaning of the word has to do primarily with training and development. God wants us to grow in holiness. So again, it's not like God is upset. Sometimes he's simply teaching, refining, training us so that we can be better. How does God chasten us? Well, back in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty, where we just were, it says this, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. All right. So weakness, physical infirmity, sickness, and even death, obviously those are tools of increasing severity, but they are tools that God uses to get the attention of, of one of his children when they won't listen. I read about a dad one time. I really like this story. He wanted his son to, he's a young boy, he's, you know, learning, but he wants him to grow. He wants him to get more and more responsible, to grow in his character and his thoughtfulness and so on and so forth. So the boy said, Dad, I want to go over and play with my friend's house, or uh, my friend. And so Dad said, yes, you can go. It's a few blocks away, but you can go. But I want you to call me when you get there. And this is a simple responsibility, but it's gonna, it's gonna, there's, uh, there's accountability. You've got to follow through with these things. So the first time the boy goes... It's a few blocks away. He gets there, and when he got there, he right away, he remembered. He called his dad. Everything's fine. It's going smooth. But after he starts making the trip a few times, he gets more comfortable. He began forgetting. He forgot to call home. Well, the first time that he forgot, his dad called just to be sure. He knew about how long it would take to get there. He called just to be sure that he had arrived safely. But then he was talking to him on the, phone, on the uh, phone and he said, son, next time that you forget, you're going to have to come home. A few days later, boy makes the trip. Dad knows by then now he should be there and there's no call. The phone's just laying there silent. Dad knew if he's going to learn his lesson, he's gonna ha I'm going to have to make him come home. I'm going to have to get him. But do you think dad was pleased by that? Do you think dad wants him to come home? Of course not. He doesn't want to punish him. He doesn't want to discipline him. In fact, he goes to the telephone in an attitude of regret because he knows that his, time, his son's time of fun is going to be spoiled by his, essentially his lack of contact with his father. And so as he's getting ready to pick up the phone, this is long enough ago that you had to dial, right? But uh, he's praying for wisdom. God, what, how should I do this? Suddenly the thought just popped into his head. Why don't I treat him like God treats me? And with that, he dialed the phone, dialed the number, 
And as soon as he heard it ring one time, he hung up. A few seconds later, his phone rang. It's his son. Hey, Dad, I made it. What took you so long to call? Oh, I'm sorry. We started playing and I forgot. But then I heard the phone ring and I remembered. You know, friends, so often we think of God like he's in the heavens with a giant fly swatter just waiting to whack us. Like he's excited to punish us when if we step out of line. But the reality is that is not God at all. The reality is he's often ringing the phone just once. Hoping that we'll remember and come home. Hoping that we'll confess and get things right. Is everybody listening tonight? Oftentimes that little one ring thing... That's when you come to a preaching service and God reminds you. This is the easy way. But anyway, let's review what we've learned. From these just few passages, we've seen that the complete cure for the effects of all of the sin in our life is conditioned upon the genuine confession of our sin to God. We have to get that right. Sin is bad, doesn't matter who does it. Even a Christian sin, it's still wrong, right? But any sin can be forgiven, any sin can be cleansed because of the blood shed by Jesus Christ. He paid for all of that. Because of the blood that he shed, God can save any sinner that will believe and he can forgive and cleanse any of us saints if we will simply confess. But if we have unconfessed sin in our life, then we are, at dis, we are in disagreement with the Father. We're at cross purposes with God. And our, as a result, our fellowship is broken. Why? How can two walk together except they be agreed? If God is going this way and we're going that way, we can't help but be apart. God cannot agree with sin. God can't change, so that we're the only ones who can, so we have to. Right? We're the ones that are going to have to repent. And so in genuine Remorse, sorrow for sin, repentance. We have to agree with the Holy Spirit, which is expressed in confession. We do that by grieving over our sin and turning from it to God. Listen, I, I, I just... Being filled with the Spirit is not complicated. It's not complicated. It's not about praying. I've heard, boy, you got to pray and pray and pray until you're filled. Nonsense, that's not true. It's not about, you know, some mystical thing. It's not even about, you know, becoming sinlessly perfect or trying to live a super pure life. It's a matter of not grieving the spirit. You don't have to worry about the sins that you don't know. You simply have to cultivate a heart attitude that is willing to confess the sins that you do know. And then, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, even the things we don't know. So tonight, if you will fully confess all known sin, you will have the hindrance to God's filling removed. So let me encourage you. Grieve not the spirit of God. Whereby you are sealed on the day of redemption. Let's stand together please. Dear friends. The Holy Spirit is being grieved. By any sin in our life. You cannot be filled. You cannot be the Christian God expects you to be. You cannot experience his blessing and power if there is something wrong in your life that you haven't dealt with. And maybe you're involved in something that you know the Lord does not want you involved in. I, I'm sad to report I've seen a lot of that. Secret addictions. Alcohol. Pornography relationships that you know you shouldn't have. Those things obviously need to be dealt with. But here's 
probably the more common. And that's that we're neglecting things we know we should be doing. Things like that you know God expects from you. And yet we're just putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. I'm not sure what it is in your life, but if there is something and you know it, then maybe right now God's just ringing the phone in your life, in your heart. The Holy Spirit can be just convicting, calling on you to make confession and get things right. Beloved, if you'll do that to yourself, the Lord will not have to get involved. But if you won't, then the chastening process will begin. Please don't make God do that. He that is spiritual does not grieve the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Lord, we love you tonight. God, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for calling us, as it were. And let that phone ring just one time in our heart where we know there's something going on that's not right. Or maybe something not happening that, that should be. Lord, you want fellowship with us. You want us to be in your word, spend time in your word, spend time praying. Spend time thinking about how we can be controlled by the Spirit so that we bring forth the fruit of love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness and faith and all the rest of it, God's self-control. Lord, I pray that you'll help us desire again to be filled with the Spirit. Desire again to be godly, the kind of Christians that please you and make a difference for you. Help us, Lord, tonight, I pray in Jesus' name.